Once you understand what is money, you got to ask yourself, why Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? What does Bitcoin actually mean? What what are the implications? What would be the consequent implications? The long, you know, the midterm, short term, long term consequences, implications, effects. It's all about freedom at the end of the day. It's all about abundance. It's all about transformational evolution within, you know, our communities, the society, our human civilization free from nation states, governments, central banks, and any other centralized criminal entity, will it be national, supranational, what have you. So the question remains, you know, with all these structures being so centralized, even in the technological realm, I'm talking about like, you know, not only like war weapons, but artificial intelligence, surveillance technologies, uh, machine learning, robotics. So what we need to do is to create a new paradigm shift where with Bitcoin, the hearts and scars is money, we create the deflationary economics where everything becomes cheaper and cheaper while you pay less and less for better and better and more innovative products and services. So freedom is a process, freedom is a path and Bitcoin is the transition key to the least frictional, uh, the most peaceful transition that we can ever imagine. So this is the talk we're going to have with Eric Kaysen. It was planned to, de- to do it, have it together with Max Hillebrand and David Collum, which I might both also respect, but somehow it didn't work out. Maybe next time uh, we can coordinate it, maybe whatever. So thank you so much for your support. Let me know your questions. My email address is hello at the totalconnect.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platform. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or desires, if you want to have any special guests on or on a panel discussion. Without further ado, this is my talk with Eric Kaysen. Uh, also follow him on Twitter and um, read his brilliant articles. Here you go, my talk with Eric. I should probably get one of those backgrounds like yours, so my. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not seeing all my junk in the background. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Bitcoin Meme Hub did that for me, sort of as a limited edition. Welcome to the show, Eric Kaysen, uh, to nice. uh, initiate this, this session. So the reason, you know, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we're doing this is that originally I wanted to do this with you, Max Hillebrand, and together with David Collum, who made some remarkable statements on Pomp's Anthony Pompliano show. Um, I just remember where he said, uh, David Collum, you know, I mean, really respect his knowledge and his, his foresight and his, his, what do you call it, diversified spectrum of, of, of knowledge. And, and the, 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 once in a while he writes an article uh, on what is it called peakprosperity.com and the last one was like recently it's called Dave, Dave Column 2020 year in view part one it's pretty interesting because what I also love about his uh, takes is on on technology and what we've missed I mean I, the way I interpreted it is they wanted to say like what kind of technological innovations we've missed in other sectors which I'm really like totally into like uh, you know uh, how much time resources energy uh, e- economics innovation has been stolen from us at least in the, in the last 100 150 100 years let's say so let's you know let's go back to the to the beginning statement of um, of Dave Colm. he said that he's you know he doesn't he he admits he says he doesn't understand bitcoin and crypto and said listen i'm i'm not into crypto either i don't know how crypto works i just know the principles the fundamentals of bitcoin i know the power i know the the, the ethos the vision and and that it works you know and that it's it's it has you know the the one and only monetary technological uh, uh parameter what do you call it uh um uh um what do you call it properties so he said something like um well like in a way he said that we the bitcoiners or bitcoin will have like a full-blown battle against the state i'm like oh interesting interesting uh, you know statement that he does like what is he exactly and that's exactly this is the statement i wanted to you know dig deeper into together with you and maybe possibly with max and others what do you think is the worst case scenario 
Like when you when you look, zoom out a little bit and see everything's been going on, like I've just been reading, you know, like people have like been vaccinated in Norway, in America, like twenty or twenty five people have died in in Norway. Like the the full blown monopoly uh, uh, use force of you know of power of of violence, um, aggression, and 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 oppression, and and and. Uh, I mean, is is that is that like the tip of the iceberg that we are about to see? I mean, I I think so. Uh, when you say worst case scenario, like it, it's sort of hard for me to answer that because, like, I do think like we sort of inevitably arrive at like what that worst case scenario is. But like through that worst case scenario being presented, like all of the solutions and answers to it also get exposed. And so, like. Um, Recently, there's been some fomenting here in the United States that with the capital riots that I think I was a French citizen donated like a lot of Bitcoin to their cause or something. And so to me, like this is the this is the preliminary agenda of like, let's link it to terrorism and, and all of these nasty crimes that we always package it up with. Um, and then I think what they're going to do is try to choke off uh, using KYC and AML regulation. They're going to try to choke off a lot of Bitcoin directly at exchanges. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to, to even say, like, I do think at some point in time there will be a 6102 kind of executive order that comes through, which was in 1933, the way that that the FDR administration seized gold from banks. I think they'll do something similar with Bitcoin. And so they'll seize your Bitcoin, give you an equivalent of USDC shitcoin, and they'll say, you know, hey, it's all good. And maybe at this point, they'll try to actually integrate Bitcoin into treasuries, which will kind of spark off the whole global movement for various central banks to try to include Bitcoin in their treasuries. But I think before that happens, I do think there's going to be this really active campaign to try to solely Bitcoin, to try to get people to refuse it, to try to get banks to refuse uh, any money that comes from exchanges. Uh, and like the this will all be kind of a hilarious Streisand effect in that like it's just going to make Bitcoin so much more valuable in so many different ways. They'll find loopholes through all sorts of various, you know, whether it's exchanging it for a gold equivalent or having it be backed by some other kind of crypto or a number of other means. But it's just going to be this constant cat and mouse escalation because at the end of the day, as you said, you know, like the, this is about raw power dynamics. And at the end of the day, like if I have my private key and I keep that secret, there isn't any sort of power that they can put onto me to release that. And that escalates all the way up until, you know, they start jailing people and uh, holding them without trial and those sort of things. Where at that point, you know, like I kind of actually expect for people to start utilizing their self-sovereign Bitcoin into trying to create new sort of uh, both legal and like physical defensive collectives. Um, whether if people actually fulfill that or not, I'm not sure. Um, like one of the things I'm actually the most scared of is that like, maybe we're all too callous to actually take any of this on at this point. Um, and that really scares me because like, maybe, maybe they do throw us in jail. Maybe we go, okay, like here, here are my keys. And maybe a lot of people do that. And when it does come time to actually stand up and defend oneself physically, uh, it's pretty clear that when people want to escalate, at least here in the United States with police force, like you, you just get shot. Like that's just kind of the end of it. Um, you know, at least I think in other jurisdictions, uh, while that isn't as directly applicable, you know, like we can just look at what's happened to Julian Assange over the last decade. You know, the dude hasn't even been charged with a crime and he's been locked up for the last 10 years. And I don't see any reason why that can't happen with other people as well. So it is a bit dark, um, but I mean, with that being said, like the cat's out of the bag, like Bitcoin has deployed, uh, you know, pretty good privacy in terms of cryptography and cryptographic protocols across the world towards everybody and baked in underneath Bitcoin is this ability to use cryptography. Like what we saw with uh, Signal becoming extremely popular over the last few weeks is really great and to me like this is sort of the model that the internet's going to take is uh it seems to me that that signal has already positioned itself as more or less being a public utility and defends itself as such and uh you know the the ceo of, of signal has 
really took a strong position both both ethically and morally to go you know look like this isn't a a, a pay per use kind of service like this is something that everybody needs and so i think as this war escalates there's going to be more heroes uh like that that are going to stand up and build these kind of tools and i think we're already starting to see that with bitcoin and i think kind of the last and final move essentially looks like something similar to to strike but like without any kind of KYC or AML, like it's just generally a collective that people can use to exchange their Bitcoin in a secure and private manner that allows for everybody to sort of network with one another utilizing it. Yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. It's not all this um, alternative or, or you know, these new uh, evolving technologies such as Strike or Signal, because I had just had a, a chat, uh, one was a couple of days ago with, um, with Janine, you know, the investigative journalist, do you know her? Uh, who does a lot of private on, on Block Digest also. And she said something like, because I asked her, you know, could, could, we, could we do like, uh, you know, as if, as if paying cash, at least with small amounts, could we do small transactions anonymously? And she said she doubts it very, uh, very heavily the, because as far as she knows, there is sort of a KYC light or these, or, the agencies or well, not the agents, but the institutions that are, might be involved in it, they could like, you know, uh, siphon off data from each other. And so it's not, because I said it would be great, you know, if, if we could, if at least, you know, for really small amounts like petty cash, or you want to do small purchases that you could, you know, transact as if you were paying cash anonymously, you know? But it doesn't seem to be. And what, what Signal is um, concerned I don't know. Um, I mean, it works with phone number, and um, so I'm not sure about their. Um, I don't have the insight, like how how their privacy policies or terms and conditions really work. I mean, it's definitely better than WhatsApp because WhatsApp is owned and controlled by Facebook. So, I, I know that Signal has uh, like its encrypted its encryption properties are good. Uh, all of the privacy experts I've talked to, you know, have, have given it a strong thumbs up. I know that they were subpoenaed and gag ordered. I think it was one or two years ago. Uh, they really couldn't provide any data because the actual uh, voice data itself is encrypted in a way that they don't have any access to it. In addition to the kind of uh, metadata they're, they're taking, it's pretty small. But with what you're saying, you know, in terms of how powerful the Panopticon is and the way that it can triangulate data, like this metadata based upon, you know, IP traffic, web cookies, all sorts of things. Like, uh, to, to like be clear, like the internet itself, like is this absolute Panopticon right now. And it, it's a fucking wreck in terms of the sort of toxic data it's spewing out that has not only identifying information, but privacy information, purchasing habits, yada, yada, yada. And so like, this all needs to get rebuilt. And I actually think that kind of over the course of the next 50 years, uh, what Bitcoin Lightning Network and, you know, other protocols that are gonna be built off, off of that, it's gonna essentially become the new backbone of the internet that is encrypting itself in this more efficient way. And I think it's gonna go all the way to the extent of, uh, you know, like we'll see new OSs appearing, uh, new web browsers, uh, new forms of chat communication, hopefully new things like Twitter and other social media that uh, are going to containerize the data in a very specific way to be able to make uh, all this track and trace stuff more difficult. And with that being said, like the on the other side too, like the government abilities to track this and, and the sort of corporate surveillance will get more powerful as well. So it's going to be a continuous back and forth game for quite a while, but at the very base, because of the sort of forms that the cryptography uses, that it can assure privacy, that it can create secure and encrypted communication. I do think that wins out long term. It's just a question of, uh, do we have the actual will to build that stuff in the interim? And two is, if we have a strong reactionary basis that really goes after and criminalizes this stuff, that can scare people enough to not want to develop them um you know and that kind of comes back to the point that i made earlier is like i'm my greatest fear right now is that people have been so thoroughly conditioned um to not fight back to not uh 
really actively want to develop and change things uh that's that's what scares me the most you know and while i see really powerful and dynamic dialogue coming from bitcoiners and what they desire uh i am seeing a lack of the actual technological development that supports all of those things that you know, it, it does make me feel pretty scared that maybe maybe we are in a bit of a fantasy world right now. And maybe maybe we do need the government to show up and smack us around a bit for us to realize uh, that as fun as this is, as much wealth has been generated, as uh, interesting as this all is, you know, like maybe when push comes to shove to fight with the state, uh, maybe we're not as prepared as we believe we are. Hmm. Wow. Do you, do you think that uh, the... Do you think they they might you know there's this whole thing with the capital uh, you know riots or whatever it's called i mean i'm I'm totally convinced that was a total you know fabricated psyop i mean yeah in my humble opinion i mean, I, mean I, I would attribute it more to uh a habram's razor kind of deal like don't don't attribute to malice which you can attribute to stupidity and so like <laughs> i think i think these were a bunch of Broy morons that more or less thought like, hey, like we'll we'll just like waltz in, like seize the capital, like maybe we'll hang Pelosi, like maybe we'll hang Pence or whoever, and like they got pretty far, you know. And I think uh, because of the way that this whole thing was manipulated, it then turned out that like after this all happened, like now they can do all of their reactionary shit, and like the the dialogue that they're calling it the Capitol riots as opposed to a protest like it originally was like to me these are all the manipulations that i find suspicious and i'm not saying what these people did wasn't wrong but the the framing of this as being like a terrorist incident and that this being a riot like this just smacks of super dangerous dialogue that um you know like now that these people have been labeled terrorists there's like literally no reason why the government can't just show up and black bag their asses. And then when they're like, Hey, like read me my Miranda rights, they're just going to get pistol whipped and told to shut the fuck up because you don't have any rights. Cause you're a terrorist. And to me, like the, this is the inherent and terrifying problem is that like when the government can unilaterally label whoever the fuck it wants to be as an enemy of the state, that means that they can now deprive that people of any and all ideas that are actually supposed to fundamentally form like our forms of governance and laws, namely habeas corpus and this idea to actually be charged with a crime and to have a judge preside over that. It seems like we've just made the reservation for ourselves at this point in time that like that's not included anymore. And to me, this is the extremely dangerous and slippery slope that we go down that like now the government can just unilaterally label whoever it doesn't like as or whoever's opposed to it politically as a terrorist. And now they don't even need to deal with jurisprudence at all. They can just throw them in a fucking cage for them to rot forever, you know, which is very yeah. similar to what happened to Julian Assange. Exactly. And they didn't even need like, a, you know, whatever. I mean, people, you know, are not really deep into the rabbit holes. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to even start with false flags. And but isn't that like the perfect form of distraction and political divide and Hegelian dialectic, like, you know, cause the problem and then people asking for remedy or whatever it's called, re calling for, solu uh, you know, a, a cry, a cry for so for help for a solution, or, a or at least they've delivered the justification. Now they've delivered themselves the justification for everything that could. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think one of the biggest things is, is uh, this entire governance model that is formulated and based out of fear and terror. And like they're, the, the dialogue's really interesting because like they're, they're not talking about the eminent risk that was posed to everybody as much as the fear of that eminent risk. And so to me, like this is one of kind of the hidden secrets of the governance forms of the world today. Like it's all just based upon being terrified prattling cowardice people that are desperately clinging to their pearls of life and that like oh god like this is the thing that matters the most whereas like i i imagine like a more powerful more glorious culture would would meet these kind of challenges head on being like yeah yeah like come to our fucking inauguration kill us if it means that much to you like go and show how you have to use violence to perpetrate your entire form of governance and like there's there's a courageous way to meet all of this. And we're doing the exact opposite of that. Um, you know, and, and I think that, that that kind of idea of 
regulating your life from a place of fear and terror like is the overarching methodology of how the entire state of affairs operates it's not about trying to create lives that are open and free and glorious and liberated but it's to be small and scared and terrified and protect all of your tiny little trinkets for yourself make sure you know be suspicious of other people be afraid of what can happen you know, don't speak too loud, look down at the ground, try to try to keep yourself as quiet as you can. And it's, uh, to me, that's the most dangerous thing that's going on right now, because people, you know, and the, and the virus was sort of an interesting uh, mind game to be played with it. Because again, you know, I, very I don't want to say it's not dangerous. I and don't want to say it's, what was that? And very convenient. I mean, you know, exactly you Perfect. know and it, you know yeah and then all they need you know i mean eric i mean all they need is just another whatever now they you know another mutation you know appeared somewhere in uk now they want to extend even in austria you know that lockdown or whatever it's called you know these measures which means another lockdowns aren't weeks. supported by scientific facts at all you yeah. know and like it's pretty yeah. clear from the metadata the thing that upsets me the most is that like uh like here in the states like they've been shutting down different uh, like outdoor parks and stuff like state parks and, and county parks and they had playgrounds shut down for a long time and all of this was supported without any kind of scientific evidence and to me like this is the scariest kind of 1984 stuff that we're going into it's where we want to utilize the science that backs and helps us but we don't want to utilize the science that doesn't support that dialogue and it's all just very suspicious to me at this point in time you know in addition to I had a good I, I had a, a co-worker say this to me recently, but the idea of a society that wants to sacrifice its youth for its old, like what what sort of form of a society is that, you yeah. know, and yeah. it's, uh, you know, like I have a young child and he hasn't been able to go to school for the last year and it, it scares me what it has, it's done for his development, you know, and the way yeah. that we're supposed to be afraid of people when we encounter them on the street or that we're always supposed to keep our distance from people and not hug them or be in close contact with them. You know, like the, these are all deeply anti-human behavior. Yeah. And it's unprecedented. And it's unprecedented. And it's all coming. I mean, you know, I mean, look, look at, look at this whole China thing. I mean, it's, there's, I mean, there's people like Michael Sanger, one of the attorneys and, you know, a bunch of other investigative journalists, lawyers who have, I think petitioned or I don't know what to call it, uh, or, or written like a long letter to investigate the, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, background the behind the scenes, what's been going on with the, with the lockdown and the propagation and uh, the, 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 the corruption of science, the corruption of data. And, you know, this whole uh, interwoven thing between Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, WHO, other institutions, even military intelligence. I mean, we don't even know. We don't. We just know the, the fraction of a fraction. And this is what makes me so nervous sometimes because I'm like, I'm not gonna let our daughter, you know, be vaccinated with some kind of, you know, whatever genetically mutated virus or whatever. And then people are dying in America and Norway. So you know, I mean, what comes next? I mean, there, it's not gonna be like that. Like it's not a like an apocalypse thing that I'm envisioning, but I'm just saying, you know, they could they could I think they they are able now to corner people now, you know, at least like if you don't yeah. do, you don't you know don't get this and that privilege or that and that benefit, and then with the central bank digital currencies, <laughs> people have no fucking idea what's coming. I you know, well, in the lockdown to me was uh, like it it created this new and very powerful methodology of house arrest where essentially the system was like, Oh, like we can turn everyone's home into a prison. And then like through their compliance, we'll like slowly let them out of that prison. But if they don't comply, we'll just like keep them there. And so like, I imagine in the near future, it'll be like, you need to get your vaccination or your kids can't go to school. You can't go to the, like, you can't do any of this stuff. Um, and it's pretty scary because in that same vein, they want to literally deprive people of the economic right to life. Um, you know, and like I, I've, I've thought about this before that like this is a, a sort of form of inverted eugenics because like it's not, it, it's doing the inversion of 
uh, like choosing who to kill because they don't have a life that's worth living. They're making the choice of allowing individuals to live because of the compliance that they offer. And then individuals who don't do that aren't within the purview or the protection of the state. Um, you know, and like, you know, the, the virus has only been around for a little more than a year. Well, supposedly, in addition to the fact that, uh, you know, these vaccines are extremely new. We don't really understand what the long-term affects of them. And I don't know, it seems really dangerous to me that like, particularly if less than, you know, uh, I don't know what the, the death statistics around the virus is at this point, but, but frankly, you know, like, look, if, if 1% of the population has to die in order for the rest of the, the world to keep their freedoms and liberties, I, I'm choosing that. Like, I'm sorry to say, but like, if it means one in a hundred people die in order for us to actually have freedom and have that have a meaningful thing and for us to be able to say, no, governments can't unilaterally choose to lock down our life because of quote unquote, the state of emergency. Um, you know? Eric, I think you have Mike. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. No I'll take this off. And Eric, you know, uh, um, my girlfriend is a chemical engineer. I mean, she worked for many years in the lab. And she said, this is so insane what they're trying to do. Uh, 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 the, the One of the, I don't know which one is it, the, the Mo Moderna or, uh, or, or from Pfizer, or whatever, you know, from whatever corporation it is the this one of the vaccines has to be cooled down frozen down to minus 70 degrees celsius and she said this is so fucking insane you can't even do that it's not it's not practical how how are they gonna like you know you can't put this in the refrigerator or anything or in the fridge you know it's uh, you know the transportation the logistics and then you know uh even if it, even if we just assume you know it's 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 a super working whatever whatever vaccination bullshit they want to sell us but the thing is you gotta like uh, you know really freeze it up down to minus 70 degrees celsius how are you going to you know transition that you know from one place to another and then to the to the end patient or to the whatever to the to the person who you want to inject that vaccine into it's crazy yeah. You know, and, and to me, like, this is uh, one part of the disingenuousness of this whole thing, too, is as you figure how many people are getting vaccines that have had a temperature flux that's, like, not actually doing anything. Um, and to me, like, this is just much more alarming about, uh, like, all of this is done in the name of, like, life and health. But, like, there, there's no stopping and saying but for like what form of life and what kind of health because like if we're talking about health like why aren't we talking about the number of suicides that have happened from this lockdown why aren't we talking about the mental health illness and the sort of despair that's coming about it in addition to just the the very real capital that's been lost i mean here in the united states there was a statistic released recently that 60 percent of businesses that closed before the pandemic will, will not open again, more than half of small businesses, you know? And like, I don't know, I think a lot about this idea of like, what does health mean when the sort of life that it offers, while it might be quote unquote safe, it's to like live in a sterile box where you don't get to experience joy, you don't get to embrace your friends, you're not supposed to, to be close to your children if they're sick. Like it's, it's really fucking crazy to me. You yeah, know, like there was a story in Southern California about a, a woman who had COVID, gave birth to her baby. The state took her baby away from I, her. Uh, I can't and believe. then she had a heart attack because she was so fucking despondent about it and died. Oh my God. You know, like. This is a parallel universe, I'm telling you. I mean, you know, everybody's is like, you know, all these, you know, intellectuals and, you know, leftists and media and journalists, they're all on the same fucking train. It's like they're all being, you know, been brainwashed. You know, you can't even talk about auto, you know, immunity, like building up your immunity. What about, you know, nourishing your body and, and building up your, you know, uh, autoimmune system? And, you know, and what about vitamins, trace elements, you know, uh, <laughs> all these things you can't even talk about that. Nobody's talking about that. Well, and to me, it's the part of the great danger is, is, is like, what about, like, how, how do we get to have any tenable idea of like what our health is without including these things? Because like now what I've seen is that it, it's this whole idea of like, 
I can't be healthy at all unless I have the authority of the doctor telling me exactly what I'm supposed to do with my body. And it, it's just a really reckless idea because you, you, you rob yourself of all of your agency in the most important ways, you know? And, and like, to, to me, the, the equivalent idea is if someone's suffering from depression and that the doctors choose to literally lobotomize them as they did in the 1960s to treat that, like that, like now they're healthy, you know, like they're drooling on themselves and like they can't think, but they're healthy. And, and like, that's a lot of what this idea is. In addition to like, let's just look at the history of health propaganda in the United States. Like, I mean, look at like the Tuskegee syphilis experiments where like literally the United States is like, hey there, like we, we love you. We're going to provide syphilis vaccine. And then they fucking infected them with yeah, syphilis. Exactly. You know, like Not even during the eugenicist programs of, you know, father of Bill Gates was in the, uh, was it was it called now? It's called Planned Parenthood, but wasn't like like the the precursor of Planned Parenthood, like the eugenicist organization. I mean, you know, it didn't start in Nazi Germany. You know, Nazi Hitler's Germany. Oh well, they got not the Nazis got all their models from the Americans. I mean, the, there was. There was literally a nine, I think it was a 1919 Supreme Court case about, uh, I think it was a woman who was being, uh, she was like being made infertile because like she was found by the state to yeah. like be incompetent to have children. And like the Supreme Court literally upheld this. The Supreme Court was like, yeah, like we have a right to, to make it so that like you're infertile and can't have children. Like what kind of a fucked up world do we live in where the state gives itself the unilateral right to deprive people of the ability to create children like that i don't know like whether you're one is religious or not like that seems to be fundamentally evil to me like there doesn't seem to be any thoughtful kind generous considerate aspect to depriving someone of the ability to have children like that just seems purely fucking wrong but I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. But to me, like, this is one of the problems is that like the, all the dialogue that we're given, all the conversations that we can have are like so deeply embedded in this very fucked up world that we can't have any sort of a tenable conversation about, well, like what does real health look like? Like is spirituality related to that at all? Like is the choice to die and own, a more meaningful way like can that be included in health and like it it all seems to have just reduced itself to this uh this silent prattling terror that like isn't even allowed to speak it's just to live in this constant state of hung anxiety you know and uh that seems to be the most powerful thing that the state can do you know is make you believe that you don't have agency make you believe that you can't think for yourself and if, uh, you know, I, I was recently reading uh, Manuel Kant's, he has a short essay called What is the Enlightenment? And it really struck me because in that essay, uh, he says the, the real motto of the Enlightenment is to have the courage to think for yourself. Yeah. And, and I think that's like that's sort of- By the way, you know, we've got to really empower and inspire and really, you know, teach our, our children like to question everything, you know? Mm -hmm. we we never learned that i never learned that in school you know it was like a, you know very conservative school i mean when did we ever learn like to question <laughs> the narratives that or the whatever the science or you know well and and it's to to use that you know the the very real idea of thinking of reasoning in a way to say wait is is this actually what works? Like, what sort of things do I know and understand? And to link that back to Bitcoin, like, that's kind of the, the powerful and important thing that's going on is people are really thinking for themselves and going, okay, there's a fixed 21 million units. They can't make any more out of thin air. They can do that with all this other shit or go like, hey, Bitcoin's kind of the better thing. But, but I've noticed more and more of that, uh, Bitcoin itself seems to just be this generalized shilling point for people to show up at, to be like, hey, I get that pretty much this entire society is a fucking scam that's built on this criminal predatory behavior. Yeah. And this, this changes it, you know? And so I very much believe that Bitcoin operates as 
you know, much more importantly than the actual monetary system, like it actually operates as a new global commonwealth for people to show up and participate and work together to try to build these new systems that are based upon the, the fellowship of the mutualism that these sort of new rules create, which is why these peer to peer protocols are so powerful and important. But, you know, we are in the belly of the beast right now. Yeah. You know, Eric, I mean, I'm not concerned about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is going and will succeed. It is already succeeding. In the case, you, you said mm. already, the cat is out of the bag. It just, I'm just trying to, you know, to you know, somehow zoom out a little bit and, and, you know, I mean, you just talk about this whole system, like, like you know, Bill Gates, he, he, he also, however he's interwoven, you know, with, with what whatever deep state, intelligence, military. I mean, there's a lot of people, I think, who have, who are either with one or both foot or both feet in the military industrial complex or intelligence. I mean, look at, you know, we don't even talk about Jeffrey Ep Epstein anymore. <laughs> it's like gone. I know. <laughs> and it's not even about Ep Epstein. It's not even about he, Epstein. He, he committed suicide, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he got himself. Exactly. I mean, I always said, you know, he's still alive, but uh, because, I mean, what happened to Ghislaine or whatever, Ghislaine, Ghislaine Maxwell? Nobody's talking to him anymore. It's like the distraction is perfect. And it's not even about these figures. They're just being in instrumentalized, but it's about like what's being, what was done through through them, like whatever, you know, extortion and blackmail and, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, politicians, uh, decision makers, corporate people, like, you know, uh, what what kind of pressure are, are, are they under? I mean, of, you know, uh, they, uh, as, you know, they, they got themselves into some kind of situation and, uh, or they, I don't know, whatever happened, you know, but uh, I'm just saying Bitcoin will succeed. It's just, the, the system feels threatened already. I mean, you can sense that, you know, it's the central bank, the, the deep state, the, the, the nation states, it's and it's also like supranational organizations already. It's not like, I don't even consider it like state by state anymore, you know, whether it be mm -hmm. Iran or any other country or Israel, I'm not a fan of any kind of regime or nation state. I think I got to clarify myself a little bit, you know, but once you well, I think that's digging me deeper, you know, it's, it's a little bit dangerous to criticize something because uh, I mean, how centralized has the corporate military technological sector has become you know interwoven with intelligence and military yeah i mean it's all one gigantic octopus at this point in time you know like they're the way that i look at it is essentially like the the nation state the the mega corporations and the military industrial complex has all interwoven each other on this very deep level um and like on the periphery of that like you have non-compliance with different regimes which like essentially the plan is, is bomb them out of existence uh you know and then like once you've bombed them out of existence like send in troops to like enslave their people and do do other horrific things uh or you have like the total reaction on the other side of of where you have like you know the taliban or isis because they're just such fucking crazy batshit people like they can actually challenge the the power structures not because like they have any great plan but just because they have like the pure horrific violence that they can use to kind of conduct that and so like we find ourselves in an, in between like uh you know essentially a rock and a hard place because uh we either get the corporatized sociopaths or we get the you know these other sort of insane periphery movements uh, and it's really sad, you know, like I, I think the only way to change it is to try to build a new sort of political consciousness. And, and like what I see that as being in the United States is trying to actually put power back in the hands of the actual different 50 states that comprise of the United States. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, that model would probably work well with, you know, in Europe. It, um, do, does Austria have provinces or states or yeah states like nine nine states you know like yeah 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 and, and so to me like i think part of the plan is is trying to push power back into those states to try to to take power from the federal government uh 
you know, and I've, I've talked a little bit about this. I'm not sure what it would look like, but it, in the United States, our constitution and article five of the constitution, there's actually a way that we can ratify and amend the constitution directly mm -hmm. through state legislatures and totally mm -hmm. circumnavigating uh, Congress at all. And I think essentially we need to have a political collective that starts trying to utilize that method to pass an amendment to the United States Constitution that essentially starts trying to strip out components of the federal government and push that power back to the states. But who knows if that shit would even work and being an anarchist like I'm pretty fucking against trying to take any sort of a legislative route, you know, like I, I'm much more interested in people trying to, to gut the system personally and from from without, which yeah. is one of the reasons why I'm such a big Bitcoin fan and I think you know, this sort of fantasy of Citadel and other things, I think a more serious dialogue has to happen. And not to say that this needs to be one place, but I think almost everywhere in the world, people need to start trying to collectively start living with other, uh, uh, mostly Bitcoiners, but I'd say if you want to try to have a more broad, uh, libertarian-esque sort of idea to unite people, that would probably be the best. Because I think... Uh, like as terrible as this huge overarching apparatus is, I do think when you find communities that are working together and that on a local level know and understand and care about each other, I think that, that that's a pretty substantial uh, influence that it can have. You know, because also like when the powers that be swoop down, they need to find a foothold somewhere. And if they don't have people within a local jurisdiction to put down that foothold, it changes a lot. Yeah. And I'm asking myself, I mean, what's left of, you know, well, let's just, you know, let's just uh, st uh, stay in within the United States. I mean, what's left of the self-sovereignty of, of Americans, uh, the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, I mean, what's really left of it, you know, in practice? I mean, nothing. And, and like that, it's just a piece of paper that is supposed mm -hmm. to give us pause to have us believe these things. But I mean, look, like the, the president of the United States was banned from Twitter mm -hmm. because he said shit people don't like. Yeah. And people are like, oh, but he was inciting violence. That's like yelling fire in a crowded theater. No, it's not. It, it, I get you don't like it. I get it is misinformation. I get that it conflicts with the general agenda. But like the, the, the thing I really want to emphasize is that the sitting president of the United States had a method of communication taken away from him because people didn't like what he was saying. Right. And yes, these are things that conflicted with the the idea of this being a free and fair election and other things but i'm really struggling to understand why it didn't become a concerted campaign of trying to meet misinformation with information and also with trying to utilize all the other apparatuses outside of silencing them you know like there's just a really really bad historic precedence of what trying to silence people for saying what they believe and how that goes you know, and uh, I find it deeply alarming that most of my liberal friends who have who believe that Trump is the the source of all of our problems in the United States. Okay, I'm not really a fan don't. of Trump either, but I think he's with all his narcissism and whatever you know psychotic conditions he's got. I think he still has some you know values or whatever it's called. Pat I mean, I'm not a fan of patriotism either, but. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's got some principles, I think. He, you know, even though I'm, I don't agree, and he's still a puppet. You know, a president is, after all, you know, he's he's like so many layers underneath this military-industrial complex or deep state. So you know, when you when you go into a presidency, uh, you you got to know what you're up to. I <laughs> mean, you got to know what you're dealing with. You know, you get the orders and you execute. Otherwise, you know, you can't go. I mean, we just you know just just think of Kennedy, you know, who tried to do this and that, or, you know, introduce, uh, you know, specific uh, bills or executive orders. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kennedy was obviously killed because he, he, he was fucking with all the wrong stuff. Right. <laughs> and they were like, we got we to gotta off this guy before he really fucks stuff up for us. Uh, you know, which in a lot of ways like that, to me, like that's kind of was the second critical intervention of the deep state and like moving forward its agenda and making it clear that like it does have a right to to going over anybody's life uh i don't like trump i think he's a moron i think uh you know he's done a lot to damage the the idea of what the american presidency is and i like that because like i remember i had an anarchist friend when trump was elected 
I remember he like he was a huge Trump supporter, and I was like, why? He was like, dude, he was like, this man is gonna fucking destroy nine tenths of this country in four years. Like he accelerates the agenda by like 20 years at least. Like he was like, we should all be really appreciative of him doing this. And I was like, he's got some valid points. Um, you know, but to me, it's gonna be more interesting watching the Biden administration come in and like essentially all of the tactics that uh, Trump was able to try out and make efficient through his administration, the liberals now get that going, you know, and like with, with Biden's $2 trillion pump it plan. You know, just like, the beginning. I mean, you know, he's going to print the shit out of everything. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, I expect to have an $8 trillion package by the end of next year. It's good for Bitcoin. Uh, good for Bitcoin. That's what I'm saying. Bitcoin will succeed one way or another. I mean, you, we will see, I think, um, you know, we, we, we won't even think or, you know, denominate uh, anymore in dollar or fiat or euro terms. Uh, uh, we're going to we're going to think in purchasing power soon because it's going to go, re- you know, beyond, the, you know, beyond the stratosphere in the next. Oh, yeah. That's my conviction within even much more sooner than anticipated. This is not well, I think it's going to, you know, this is not what I'm concerned about. This is it's going to, not only institutions, everybody. I think even Elon Musk is now right now, you know, com- communicating with Michael Saylor how to play the book, you know, and how to play the whole script. And 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 he's I think he's he's there all these institutions and family offices and pension funds and, and you know, the FOMO is kicking, kicking, kicking in. So uh it's it's unstoppable what i'm i think what i'm trying is to 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 describe here my my concerns is that it has become people you know it just just because the most people think for themselves something is not possible from their perspective they think others can wouldn't do that, such a thing you know if we talk oh, about yeah reduction of population i mean you know we i just you know we said in, even before recording i said this is not about politics this is about control this is about power. <laughs> this is about obsessive power, obsessive control, and obsessive, uh, you know, uh, whatever. It's uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like profit gear, greed, you know. Uh, but that's like to go to corporate level. But I think on the on the layers much much higher. This is real about controlling humanity with all the you know technology going on, you know. For absolutely for sure you know like the this is a pure power dynamic and i think uh you know my most recent essay that i published was on, on carl schmidt's the concept of the political and he's very pedantic in that of that like look like the political is what fundamentally involves the right to life and violence like if you can kill somebody like that is the most political thing it was like so like you need to think in terms of of this idea of between friend and enemy and how one can reserve that right for themselves that if somebody is a strong enough an enemy like you have a right to destroy them and i think like a a good example of talking about that idea of that because some people don't think it's possible it can't happen like look like that like there were six million jews in europe who legitimately were like they won't fucking kill all of us lo and behold they tried to actually do that and i think it's really important to to emphasize that point because This is something that at the beginning of the 1930s, while there was a lot of dialogue against the Jews and racism and these sort of things, nobody ever thought that that kind of stuff was even remotely possible. And I think that as we go into this kind of insane future that we're already looking into, uh, like while there's ideas of mandatory vaccinations at this point in time, and there's also ideas of people saying, no, like that's not possible. I think we get three years out from now and we try to like, I think the dialogue more will be like, how, how could have we not seen that if we chose to not get vaccinated, that the state wasn't going to attack us, you know, like, mm-hmm. of course. And I think furthermore, that like, as, uh, and I agree with you, like B- Bitcoin's going to win. It's going to go, it's going to continue to deflate forever. It's going to cause, a, it's going to be a real thorn in the side of those who want to control money and power. Especially be- Christine Lagarde, right? <laughs> We're talking about like the criminally convicted, like former IMF chief, you know, who is like, uh, you know, found gil- like guilty, convicted criminal f- a felon, you know, of, of embezzlement because of whatever, you know, she should have uh, uh, challenged the arbitration, whatever, and then 400 million went to a friend of Sarkozy. And then she talked about funny business. Bitcoin is a funny business. Like $2 trillion are being whitewashed, laundered every year through all kinds of institutions, big banks. And <laughs> it's, it's so hilarious, you know? Well, yeah, 
it, like it is funny. Like it, like it, and like you can kind of laugh at it if you can like step back from how horrific the things are. And like it, I I don't know. Like anybody who trusts these people or what they say, it. Uh, I was talking to a younger kid, you know, like like a teenager uh, about a week ago, and like sort of the starry eyed hope. I just like I I realized like it was a youth thing of, of you know and eventually I was like look kid I was like I get that you really believe in the wonderful glory of the government to be able to do great stuff and to help and I was like and I want to be clear that is absolutely true there is a possibility for that that is not this government at all you know I'm like saying that who's kind of like huh I wonder and, and I and I emphasize this because like. I don't want to take away the idea of that, like, maybe we could fix all this shit and make government into this great thing that's really helping people operating judiciously, blah, 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 blah. That's not this current system at all. And, like, we really need to try to move away from a belief that this is what it is. Um, you can't fix this. I mean, come on. People have this this naive, I don't know, uh, believe that, you know, we can fix things from within or we have to, we can restructure or transform the, the existing, you know, legacy system or governmental st structures or centralized, you know, entities. It's over. We got to like, you know, build from scratch. And that's the only one and only thing that is, and that is Bitcoin, you know, otherwise it's it's doomed to fail, you know. You know, and like the the other thing that kind of scares me is like, uh, like the generalized infrastructure of this entire life that we have. Like, it's not conducive to trying to live in any more of a long term, thoughtful way. You know, like, despite the fact that I live in a great agricultural region that can grow fruit really well, like, there's pretty much no fruit around me. There's a shitload of wine grapes, and everybody makes the shit out of wine around here, which is not very useful to the local economy, but it's really useful to the international economy. You know, and like until we start restructuring things on these smaller localized levels that we start really trying to develop our own communities for what we need, start educating our kids according to what are real principles of actual education. Uh, and like this restructuring is from top to bottom. And uh, there's this really interesting cat and mouse dynamic that keeps going on because like uh, the decentralization and the recreating of new kinds of media from music to YouTube videos to TikToks or all of the different forms that there are. It's this great presentation of how new forms of entertainment can be disseminated. However, they're all getting caught up and captured in all of these new forms and systems of control. And when it's only when we finally arrive at sort of the Bitcoin equivalent of a YouTube, the Bitcoin equivalent of, uh, you know, a SoundCloud, of all of these different things that like stuff's really going to change. And, uh, you know, while Signal does leave more to be desired in terms of like not using phone numbers of, of other encryption schemes, uh, it's a start in the right direction. And I'm hoping that those are the sort of movements that are going to start unlocking stuff. But truth be told, like, I think shit just has to go into kind of wacky gonzo land for a while. Like, I think governments have to hyperinflate currencies. I think there has to be a lot of struggle and difficulty and trouble for a while. And it's scary because, like, we have our Bitcoin. We have our lifeboat. We'll be OK. Uh, most other people, that's probably not true. You know, most other people are going to have to take their $600 from the government and go back and beg for more at the end of the month. You know, most people... Yeah are going to find one day they go to withdraw money from their bank account to pay for a down payment on their house and they can't get that money. You know, like it's, it's going to be a lot of very painful lessons for people repeatedly until it finally gets to the place of, oh, we should never trust these people with anything ever again for any reason. Yeah. So UBI, I you, you think UBI, UBI is coming one way or another. Oh so, yeah, like yeah, like yeah. that. Gonna come. Money it's printer goes brr, and yeah. that's going to go it's, on. Otherwise, forever. I think it's going to be a, like a bloody civil war, and and people are. I mean, we are we're probably going like you are your you know more or less on the countryside or or you know agricultural side, and we're moving probably next year, uh, this year actually, this year, April May, more to the countryside. You know, so we're going to have like animals and plant, you know, things. Nice. So I think they'll build more of a breakaway civilization is what I'm trying to say, you know. That's yeah, and that's what I'm really seeing and hoping for more is uh, more and more people are kind of talking and thinking in that way. And while I haven't seen strong uh, 
movements to try to communalize and actively create those communities. I do already see that a lot of people are making those choices, you know, I'm like, like I moved back to the hometown I grew up in just cause like, I know everybody here. So if like anything was to go down, like we have a wide network of people to help out in addition to like, uh, there are a lot of fruit trees and other agricultural things going on. So if food supplies got short would be cool. Um, you know, but like, we're, we're probably even going to move farther out. Like I, I'd really like to get a piece of land by the coast. Cause like, I think as, uh, you know, what's, what's happening with the kind of global pollution levels and changes to the, to the climate. Like I, I'm pretty afraid that, uh, you know, summers are going to start becoming these pretty radical events that'll probably kill off large handfuls of people because, you know, here in America, we have a shitload of people living in the middle of the desert, you know, cities like Phoenix, Arizona. We just need one event for the power to go out for an extended duration to, you know, kill off 100,000 people or something. So I don't know, like the, the whole transition out of this industrialized totalitarian society it's it's going to be painful you know and I, I wish i could say it would be a nice kumbaya of us making the decision to create a totally new political identity mm -hmm. but the truth is is like most people can't even consider the idea of like a non-status form of politics yeah like people yeah, that's the thing. yeah. The, yeah, like the best people can do, particularly in the United States, is the idea of like a third party, like the Libertarian Party. Uh -huh. But the idea of, of trying to dispose of this way of being oh and organize differently, because people... they think in chaos. Yeah, even I think uh, who was a, you know, prominent podcast. I'm not going to name him, but you know, he's I don't know. He, sometimes he makes statements. I'm like, you know, hasn't he learned anything? He still, you know, he does so many talks with Giacomo Zucco. You know, Giacomo Zucco, you know, is like a super libertarian and freedom seeker, you know. And I'm like, I don't know. Some people just remain in this status, like, like, like as if the government or state didn't exist anymore. We would like, you know, plunge into, you know, chaos and disorder and whatever. I mean, as if private contractual organizations or entities or, you know, companies couldn't, couldn't take care of, of, you know, of the things they, that government should actually be taking care of. And they, you know, and in a, you know, as we talk about this, like, uh, you know, many times about this, also with Jeff Booth about deflationary economies, localized economies with the, with the scarcest money, like Bitcoin, we can finally evolve, you know, into this much more efficient uh, uh, super society, you know, where, and I think we'll get there. I think the struggle to get there is going to be pretty difficult. And a large part of it is uh, going to see governments break themselves through hyperinflation. Because I think one of the things is as they go into hyperinflation and they start seizing Bitcoin, uh, like I, I very much expect for the state to start like actively hunting super wealthy people and for like it to become a pretty crazy dynamic, you know, and like, uh, most of these wealthy people got to their position through the relationship that they have with the state and you know getting sponsorship and all of these other things uh but it's also pretty clear to me like there's a whole orboros concept that happens at the end here where like it eats itself and so like i very much expect uh in california at least like i very much expect us to go after the wealthiest people to like try to extract wealth from them directly hey and it's just, it's an unwinnable game, you know, it, it's, I think it's kind of comical because like everybody sort of knows all these things and they've been reviewed, but when it actually comes time to do it there, there's this thought that like, not us for some reason, you know, and like, that's, that's the kind of place that we're at in the United States right now. It's like, well, inflation happens in other countries, but not, not to the United States. Uh, and while I think like the exorbitant privilege, the dollar has, uh, it's going to last a little while longer. Uh, you know, it's days are definitely numbered at this point in time. So we'll, we'll see what happens with it, but you know, it, it's troubling because while Bitcoin has given us this new sense of Liberty to cling to, um, you know, it's, it's like getting, it's like getting this sparkling glowing jewel in the darkest of night like while it's shining brightly you like realize how fucking dark everything is around you you know and like uh and i've talked to john Vallis about this a bit like 
I, I kind of just want to retreat into the forest and like live my own private life. You know, yeah, like I, yeah. I can do that now. Yeah. And as much as I care about the society, like, yeah, my, my the position, reward's not really I, there. Yeah, since I have, you know, since we have our daughter, I mean, my position has changed. I, I told my girlfriend, you know, just recently, I said, you know what? I mean, if it were up to me, if we had like, if we were totally like independent and we could just leave, I would just really go somewhere, I don't know, somewhere else and into the jungle or, you know, into nature and, and grow, you know, and have our daughter like grow up in, with nature, with, you know, homeschooling and, you know, healthy food and self-grown food. So I don't know. I mean, more and more Bitcoiners are talking about this and I'm starting to think like we just need to find some jurisdiction where we all feel comfortable and, and yeah. could, you know, congregate on it. And like, it'll probably be weird. There'll probably be hiccups, but you know, I, I think that would be for the best. And that's what I'm looking for. So if any listeners, you know, know of a good place or like, I know in New Hampshire, they've had like kind of the, the Liberty movement out there. But um, one of the difficulties for me is like, you know, I, I really wear, love where I live. I obviously know that any successful Bitcoin Citadel or capital can't, isn't going to find itself into California. So that's pretty difficult, but I don't know, maybe the Oregon coast or something like that. I think that would be a pretty safe and open place. I like that they they decriminalized psychedelics recently. Yeah. Um, you know, and Oregon overall has a a pretty libertarian form of government. So I don't know, maybe. Or even but, Austin. I mean, I mean, you know, I've never been to Austin. I've never been to Texas. But like, obviously, so many people are like, not only Joe Rogan, but like so many people from California are immigrating to Austin. It's like supposed to be like the you know a very open-minded very you know diversified so-called diversified society and structures and where you can you know have a decent life but i guess i don't know do you need to be like still financially independent and you know have your own ranch or something like that yeah you know it's still a major capital city and for me i'm thinking more of like i'm like a pretty small rural town that can really support uh, a lot of like local agriculture has good water access. You know, I don't know. In, in addition to, to maybe this is something that we just need to find a whole bunch of these scattered all throughout, you know, the globe. But um, it, it does it does warm my heart to know that more and more people similar to your viewpoints, uh, you know, they don't want to be in the city. They want to spend time with their kids. They want to have animals. They want to be in nature. And I honestly think that that's where a lot of the solutions are going to come from. You know, like we can unplug more, we can blind the panopticon and not participate in it. We can uh, be far enough out that when strangers do come along, we can recognize them and identify them. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's sort of the life that we have to offer ourselves is that, and I think the pandemic has been helpful in kind of displaying that like the the form of life that's available in the cities is one that's of compliance to this whole system. Whereas when you get outside of cities, there's, there's a different form of life to be had. It seems like, you know, there's this like the parallel matrix or universes is like the one, the one is the technological advancing, you know, uh, innovative society. I mean, it's just too much emphasis for me on, on this digital realm, you know, would it be, the internet, you know, the, the, I don't know, the communication thing, the, uh, the artificial intelligence, but then on in so many other sectors, I don't know where, I'm just asking myself, where are those entrepreneurs? There's, you know, there's a bunch of good, decent people. I'm not even sure Elon Musk is a good, decent man, you know, who wants to innovate, who wants, who has a vision, but there are, I guess, thousands of Elon Musk are there, you know, who want to innovate in a specific field would it be i don't know you know hydrogen engines you know <laughs> energy production environmental cleansing transportation where is the innovation you know why is there so much focus on on the digital realm this is what i just don't grasp it's i think that's coming you know i think i think the digital realm has had this weight to it that's allowed for um essentially kind of like an exploitive capitalist greed to, to happen. But I also think with like Bitcoin being at where it's at, I think we're going to see much more innovative investing going on in addition to uh, like, I think this tension between entrepreneurs and capitalists is starting to, 
become more and more tense. Mm -hmm. And so far, like the entrepreneur is trying to fundamentally create something new that changes how a system operates, whereas the capitalist is just trying to get the total assurance of the return of their profits. Mm -hmm. And I think Bitcoin really helps emphasize that tension more and more to a place where like, I think we'll probably start seeing really powerful modes of fundraising, utilizing Bitcoin, not to create a shitcoin project, but to try to do something really dynamic and different. You know, maybe, I, I would really love to see some kind of, uh, you know, like a space startup that's like using Bitcoin to help fund itself. I'd love to exactly. see like a rail cannon project yeah, or something like yeah. that. And, you know, I mean, there, I'm sure there's so many Bitcoiners out there who are so-called Bitcoin OGs. And I'm hoping and I, and I think they have the ethos and the vision for that. They're, they'll be the, you know, the first ones who, who become, you know, multimillionaire, billionaire, trillionaire. And I'm hoping that they will really start creating those structures, infrastructures and the zero to one technological innovations. You know, with all the geniuses, there are so many ingenious people out there, you know. Would it be engineers, scientists, inventors, you know, uh, entrepreneurs? Like if they just come together with the power of Bitcoin, I think we can, we can, we can achieve miracles. To be honest with you, I mean, and that's why I would love to see a collective like that get together and build a new city. You know, from mm -hmm. from addressing housing to to you know water issues to sanitation and sewer, like the entire infrastructure getting rechanged uh, in addition to like this idea of, of bringing back Baroque architecture or other, like these really yeah. beautiful yeah. and incredible cities, you know, I'm like, uh, to be honest with you, something I've been doing more myself is just writing more fiction so I can just really steep in. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, I want to, I want to really steep in these ideas more deeply. And like, I don't want to deal with the messiness of let's reality. Eric, let's make a movie. I, I, if, I, if I've, you know, if, if, if Bitcoin ever goes to, you know, uh, astronomical heights, I mean, I want to make a movie like on, based on authentic background and facts and, and, you know, on a vision, you know, wouldn't that be like, like something that we could give to people, like a vision, like uh, not only, you know, we don't need to pitch it, but like, this is the reality we can create with everything that we have already. I'm down for that. I think, uh, yeah, I think it would, it would be a lot of fun, you know, and like, that's why I keep coming back is, is, you know, I want to help spread these visions and I really do want to help create this freedom for people too you know i want them to dynamically engage with me and show me that they're interested but you know if they can hold up their end of the bargain i want to hold up my end of the bargain so well i should i need to get back to my kids shortly yeah, um, nice hey eric it was great talking to you we need to continue this uh maybe in the new future I'll, I'll i'll try to coordinate this uh uh, uh unfortunately it didn't work out this time but uh oh no worries it's always a pleasure talking I yeah. always enjoy it greatly. Congratulations again, my friend. And, and yeah, I look forward to the next conversation that we have. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah, really happy about that. Okay, Eric, take care, all right? All right. Thanks, okay. man. Be well. Ciao. Hey, so how'd you like this conversation? I hope you love this conversation as much as I did with Eric Kaysen. Please make sure you follow him on Twitter and you read his excellent articles. It's just really mind-blowing. Our talk was really mind-blowing. We covered a lot of topics and we were, really went deep into the rabbit hole. Um, please make sure you follow me on Twitter. Subscribe, please, to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. And if you really love this episode, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. And yeah, you know, I mean, just ask yourself, what is money? Why Bitcoin? What, it, what does Bitcoin mean to you? What, you know, what, what, what could be, you know, the end, the end goal here? What is the desire, the dream that we have, the vision? And you, you know, you will, you will boil it down at the end of the day to freedom, to abundance and to a totally evolutionary human civilization. And it is possible. We just need to comprehend it, not just hope and you know and desire but really comprehend it and and go into human action buy bitcoin and spread the, spread the education and educate and inspire empower other people your friends your neighbors your family members whatever that is just sow the seeds and it will come back just give it without any expectation with unconditional love and you will see we will on ev in every dimension every level we will create a totally unimaginable human civilization and you know as we talked about you know just to take technologies i mean why haven't we had in the last hundred years any kind of zero to one you know uh, technological uh, innovation or 
you know, evolution, whether it be transportation, energy, or, you know, whatever it is, environmental cleansing technologies or, um, or anything else, right? We've had it in digital uh, realm, but not in every other sector. So this is, you know, big, big, huge question mark. So we can finally, with Bitcoin, we can defund the state, the criminal nation state, the government, the central banks, and the military industrial intelligence corporate complex. And finally, you know, be really human our, and unleash our t total human power. Without, uh, you know, going into any further rabbit hole, thank you so much again for your support. Make sure you follow me, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And... Uh, thank you so much again.